one of the approaches that I take in sessions like this is to share real time experiences, especially experiences that were not so good, but shaped the understanding of what I now know differently and how things can be done better. So it's possible that my experience that I'll be sharing with you is at that time, it was a negative experience, but it has now helped me to improve on whatever I am doing today. So it's not an all beautiful experience, uh, quote and unquote. That's also what I, also, I wanted to put out here. Okay, so anyone with any question or you want me to just start first? I think it would be best to start first. So you okay. give us a direction. Okay, all right. So I, I'm starting now the breakout session that I have before me. Let me just read out what is here. Okay, storytelling for, for branding and public relations, building a positive reputation. So let me start this way to say, what is it that everybody wants? Like everybody, when you say you are a brand, what is it? It doesn't matter the size of your brand. It can be very, just one man, it can be a few people. It can be large corporates, as it were, multinationals. But let's dimension it to there is a common thing that everybody wants. And that thing is when people think about you, what should come to their minds is positive. What should come to their mind is positive. Now, why that is what everybody wants. It is not the experience of everybody. Let me also tell you that there is no one brand that has its reputation constantly and continuously positive. I don't know that brand yet. Like every brand, we always at some point face one difficulty or the other. So I start again by saying, what does everybody want? So when we say for brand storytelling, for branding, public relation, and you now put positive reputation. Rep your reputation is something that when we see you, what do we think? Like when they mention your name, when you mention Leap Africa, what comes to mind? When you mention Africa, what comes to mind? Just do some kind of imagination now. Think of a name an individual name, male or female. Think of a brand, big, small, and of whatever size. And just pause, reflect for a few minutes to say, what do I think of them? What do I think of them? Let me answer like this. That thing you think of them, you didn't think of it from a vacuum. You thought of it, and that is your mindset about that either that individual or that organization, it is based on the available information to you. You didn't assume it, you didn't imagine it, you didn't create it from nowhere. It is based on the available information to you. So when we speak to reputation, we have to be very careful to understand that sometimes what you tell yourself as what you are, what you stand for, what you do, is not necessarily what people think of you or what they know about you. And may I also announce to you that the reputation that you have is not of what you think or know of yourself, is of what your target audience think and know of you. What it therefore means is that 
there can be a disconnect. So brand A can say, I'm all nice, I'm all good. My customer interaction, my product service delivery, my all of that, the end-to-end -end processes, nothing wrong, it's all good, it's all nice. But the end user can think the exact opposite, like the exact opposite of what you think of yourself. So that is something you must know. And I am saying that your reputation is not what you think or say of yourself. Your reputation is what your target audience think or say about you. I don't know if anyone understands that perspective. That is a disconnect. In some cases, there is a, no, let me take it again to say, in some cases, that is the reality in the sense that what A think of itself is not what the users and the target user of A thinks of it. If it is that case, there is a disconnect. It means there needs to be a storytelling to shape the reputation and bring back what the desired outcome should be. In the case where there's a correspondence between what I think, what A thinks of itself and what the users of A, either as product or services think of it, is fine and is the same. In that case, it means you have told your story nicely and therefore there is a correlation, there's a correspondence. You are on the same page. So if A says, I have integrity, the target audience of A, they confirm that they have integrity. If A says, I'm a pioneering person, I lead in innovation, and the target audience say, yes, they confirm that it is so on and on like that different dimension of yardsticks and metrics to measure that. But where the problem lies and where we should have the discourse today should be at that point where there is a disconnect. So that if you're in the space of public relations, of marketing, of branding, of activation, how do you now shape the narrative to your target audience for them to now align with you that if you say this is what you stand for, that is what your end users actually think of you as what you stand for. So I like to get feedback on that set on what I just shared before I continue into if we establish that by using an analogy now to say there is a disconnect, we now want to move into how do we now craft our storytelling to make the reputation of that brand A that is things of itself that is good. Whereas the users, the target audience say it is not. Before we go into that, let's get comments from people and reactions, please. Okay, I get a question. How can how can you use okay, please can you speak more to how brands can leverage the power of storytelling? Yeah. So that's where we're going to now to say we've established there is an issue. This is what you think of yourself and that's not what people think about you. That is the reputation that they have of you. We're now going to how can we leverage the power of storytelling to bring about our reputation being intact? Can I proceed, please? Yes, you can. Okay. Now, here's how I want to proceed with the first point I like to share, a few points to share. The first thing is, you need to define yourself. You need to define yourself. Okay, I can see the question. You need to define yourself. And in defining yourself, you can be a whole lot of things that you are saying. You are a maker of this. You are the service provider of this. All of that, you can be a whole lot. Now, whatever it is you say you can be, let me tell you that the easiest way to tell that story is number one, have a particular messaging that you say and you pass at every point in time. There is a place of consistency. So you start from crafting your message. So some people say, this is my vision, this is my mission, this is my this and all of that. It begins from those little things. It begins from those little things. Now, 
when you have that narrative put together as what you want to be, in this small organization, it can be just you, that is the MD, the CEO, the everything, when particularly you are a startup. When you do that, the way to start shaping your narrative is your consistency matters. You have the opportunity to tell your story on platform A. Let it be that what you said on platform A is what you say on platform B, on C, on and on like that. When people notice a pattern of consistency, you are framing your narrative and what you say you are is what they will take you to be. So the first thing I've said is craft your message, which is your identity. So even things like logo, colors, your, 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 your payoff line, they are all part of your messaging. When you have now crafted that, I started from the very small part to say, you must now be consistent in telling your story. If there is inconsistency in your narrative, you said this in platform A, let's look at channels now. There are multiple channels, digital channels, online, Instagram, WhatsApp group, DP, and all that. And what we do not know, let me give you an instance, what we do not know. If you're a small business, your DP is part of the message and your, and your storytelling. How you put your name, how you put your name in your DP, that if someone wants to save your number without calling you to ask your name, is part of your storytelling. How the kind of images you put as your DP is part of your storytelling. The kind of things you put in your status on any of the channels is part of your storytelling. So take for instance, you 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 are you are a brand on mental well-being, or even things on uh, well-being generally. But the things that you post about, the things that you share, are things that traumatizes people you are not telling the right story. Because we are now in a world where the power of vision is stronger than the power of text. So you must strongly connect between what you say, what you share across all platforms. Some people will say, oh, this is not my official comms channel. Some people will say, no, here is just play. I, I use it to play. No, when we say consistency, it costs across every area and ch uh, channels that you have the opportunity to share. That is how powerful storytelling can be. Do not, dis uh, do not uh, discontent us one for the other. Let it be that if you have 10 channels with which they can reach you, let it be a consistency of pattern of what they see. The moment they see that, there will be a gradual shift of mindset of who you are. And who you are in those channels is what they will define you to be. Now, after speaking of consistency, consistency is dimensionally too. I mentioned you can be a small startup where you are the everything. You get to the office, you are the cleaner. You get to the office, you are the one that does your internet. You are, the, you are everything. You are, the, you are your IT guy, you are this. You must be consistent in your messaging. When you, when you begin to grow, you are now five, you are now 10, you are now a big company, hundreds. You must have people who speak on your behalf. Those people must undergo what you call training to understand this is the brand, this is what we stand for, this is what we do. And they must embrace the culture of the organization so that there is, a, again, consistency has now moved away from when you were one man, one lady yeah. for the business, to a point where you are now yeah. not everybody in your organization is so, spokesperson. I, you yeah, identify yeah, spokespeople yeah, and you train them to be able to say so that it comes back to that point of consistency in your messaging. Now, the next point I want to talk about before I pick the questions on it in terms of branding and all of that is that there must be authenticity. So it is not a thing of 
I am consistent. Authenticity is the place of experience. So whatever you say, you are delivering, either as a product, as a service, that is what you are delivering to your target audience. The truth is, there must be a correlation between what you promise and what people experience. Because the place of experience is real life. So if you promise this and they experience the opposite, trust me, you have broken the trust of your story. And it, would, it, it is easier to break the trust than to win back the trust. So following what uh, so the, uh, the pattern is, what is your message? You must be consistent in telling your story across platforms. When you have become of a certain size, you must now have people who speak for you. Not everybody should be speaking for the organization. Train them on how to speak, what to say, when to say this, and all of that. Then you also now added the place of authenticity, which is very close to experience. Give people the right experience, and they will speak in your favor. You see all of that happening on social media, and it happens a lot presently. So I think there was an instance of recently one producer, female producer, one of her uh, personal said that she uses a lot, had issues, and eventually the person passed. And of course, the sibling of the person that passed came online to say, you were not there. You were not there when we needed you. And so that was a bit of a reputation issue. But I also saw that there were people who on their own came out to say, she is not this kind of person. This is who she is. That is people speaking from their experience. Again, be careful to understand that there is no perfection. As long as human beings are involved, it can never be 100%. So I'm also giving the benefit of doubt to say, in the human nature of brands and organization and people, give room for some level and dimension of errors. So the reputation of a brand that is green does not necessarily mean that their processes, their people and all of that do not sometimes have bad experience. But the goal is to minimize the experiences that are not so good, take them very quickly as feedback to improve on your processes and your people to continue to deliver authentic experience. So those are some of the things to, to, to share. Now, let me go to the chat section to respond to questions. Okay, how can we, how can one balance emotional appeal and preserving the African dignity, particularly for a non-profit brand? Um, emotional appeal and preserving the African dignity. So what I hear in my head is you need some kind of imagery to be able to get the sentiment and buying of people. But at the same time, you do not want to make the people look very vulnerable, like it's a, it's a pity party. That's what I hear in my head. Now, here's my response to it. There was a day I was having a chat with someone about four or five years ago, and we're writing a story of how we, we, we try to support uh, women in a certain community by empowering them in the way that we can using our products. So we give them our product to start a business. And so the guy came to me and said that you are helping the, the poor. You are helping people that do not have a future. You are helping, you know, he used all sorts of words. And I looked at him, I said, no, I'm not, I'm not. That they, no, I said, they are not that everything you have said and used to describe them is not who they are because they didn't write letter to those conditions and circumstances to say, I want to be this. It happened to them. There are children born in such circumstances. There are people who grew up that that is their reality. They never wrote a letter to say, I want to be born into this community 
sorry, um, power just went off, but the camera will adjust if you can still see me. Now, the 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 understanding from us when we're doing our write-up, we began to be very careful with our choice of words. So rather than use those very negative words, we have to find very words that are dignifying to describe the state of the people that we went to support. And one of the words that we were able to come up with was we asked ourselves, why are these people like this? In our analysis and profiling, we realized that it was because of the deprivation of certain services by the government to them. So it's okay, if someone is deprived of certain things, it means in our own understanding, the person is underserved. And so rather than use those very unpleasant words that people use to describe people, because don't forget that these people are human beings. It could have been you that is in that situation and they in your situation. The question is, would you love to be described that way? I'm sure it's a no. And so we found that the word underserved in our, I don't know, maybe you can critique it, we found that such words were more dignifying. So rather than us to go and headline, we have empowered even the word indigent. We should be careful how we use it because it is not so dignifying. Not to talk of the outright use of such words are poor people, vulnerable people. So those are words that I am saying in my own understanding to say, let's play down on them. The word that we found that was perhaps more inclusive in mindset without making them feel uh, undignified was to say underserved communities, underserved people. Because truly, if they were not deprived of certain amenities, certain infrastructure, their conditions would not be like that. And so we use the word underserved. That was what we came up with. So in balancing emotions and preserving dignity, your job as a storyteller is to find the right choice of words and the right context. So you might want to show some images that are not so pleasant, but guess what? There is a place of you not outrightly shining the spotlight on their faces in their vulnerable state of not well covered and all of that. It is all about in you, how you take the images either with your phone or with your professional cameras and all of that. You can still attract the support you need, either funding or anything without necessarily uh, making people feel undignified in the way they look and in the way you write about them. So I am challenging you to say, please, in shaping the narrative from a public relation perspective and branding, you do not necessarily attract the best of goodwill when you speak down on people. You only join in the conversation of worsening their condition by the way you have described them, whereas you have good intentions on one hand, but on the other hand, you are damaging their dignity. So our job as storytellers in branding, in public relations, and in building a nice reputation for Africa, for our communities, is to begin to tone down the harshness of the kind of words we use. Because put yourself in their situation. Would you like to be described in that way? I'm sure it's a no. That's the response I have on how do you balance uh, emotional appeal and preserving the African dignity, particularly by for a non-profit brand. So let me check again if there are more questions. Okay, um, a hand is up. Augusta or Kafo, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. So I didn't know how to tie because it's kind of long. I decided to ask. <laughs> So now here is my question. You mentioned something in the healthcare sector where people, like you say, for instance, someone is in health tech, in healthcare, you have to post your, you have to keep posting, being consistent in what you're posting on social media. Now, considering the fact that healthcare is actually a kind of boring environment or industry, 
and you have to post. Now, I feel that the good part of it is that like you keep posting on things relating to healthcare, things relating to you building your startup on your social media. The good part of it is that it attracts the right people, that serious minded people to your platform. However, the engagement is kind of low because people are looking for, people are directly or indirectly looking for something that makes them happy. Something that um, takes away their minds from the vicissitude of lives and stuff like that, which is why you see entertainment industry thriving because people want to be happy. Now, my question is this, how do you balance this? Because you don't want to, you don't want to show yourself out there as being unprofessional. At the same time, there are some certain things you can't post. How, where do you, where do you strike a balance with the, with the two situation, professionalism and being semi-professional? kind of like being caught in the middle. Thank you. Okay, can you please uh, stay on the call? Like don't mute yourself. I, I want us to, I'm gonna ask you a question and uh, my mind is, if I'm correct, you will answer the question yourself. Um, Dr. Proko, is he unprofessional? If you know Dr. No, Proko online. No, he's not. Is he unprofessional? He's not, no, right? he's not. But is he passing the right message like is it, I, I i'm not a doctor but I, mm -hmm. I, i'm not into that feed so i, I can't yeah. tell if he but to you that is in that feed i'm asking is he passing the right message from what you know in your practice yes he is okay so i am not saying that everybody should become dr apropos but it's just that he's a success story of how you can Okay, so I'm coming from the situation where this person is a startup builder, not a content creator. I don't know if you get me, because yeah. it's just a very timeline and you, you deviate from what you originally have. I don't know if you get this person is building a business. So you're dealing with the intricates of the, the challenges that come with building a startup. You understand you are lost yeah. in work. Mm -hmm. However, you don't want to be off, offline. You want to create that presence. So how do you how do you balance it? Aproko is the doctor. He's creating awareness, but he's actually a a content creator when you put okay. it in that. So, so my, my gut feeling is that you know him as a content creator. I don't know him more than what I just see um, mm -hmm. out there, but I, I am thinking that it is not impossible that either directly or indirectly he has a practice. I may not be correct. But let's go back to the startup person. The startup person, remember on the general side where we said, start with what you have and from where you are. You must understand your environment, your area, your, your operating environment. I know environment can be contextualized. It can be a physical environment. It can be a bigger environment, which is virtual and that's online. So the question is, if we look at a typical local environment, what do you think? Because you are the one that is there. What do you think is a need that can you can provide a solution to, to attract people to yourself? I, I grew up from a typical African community way back when I was good on before I came to Lagos. I know people will call nurse. I would call them nurse because we know that that's what they do. So I'm asking myself, how did we get to now start calling them nurse? And you know, these people, nurses are very powerful, even chemists in such communities, because they end up becoming the doctors that everyone has access to. So I'm saying that if you break it down, let's not overthink it. In your startup that you are doing now, your location, your physical location, there must be a way that you can bring yourself up to relevance in that community. It can be you engaging with your place of worship, which can be any of the religions that you practice. So let's not discountenance the power of our associations. It can be from your immediate family. It can be from your old school association. You can break it down on and on like that. And before you know it, from where you are with what you have, you are starting. Give yourself time, like be patient with yourself and give it time. Again, understand that you experiment, you fail, 
So some things you tried might not work. Some things you didn't plan might come up, but just keep adapting to stay relevant in that space. That's what I think. And I do not believe this answer your questions or not. They say we have eight minutes left. Let me just go through to see if there's any other person, any other question. So this one says, what, uh, what is the key role storytelling? What is the key role of storytelling in brand building process? So I don't know if all of the things I've shared, number one, to say, if I recap, what is your message? From there, you move to be consistent in telling the story. And that consistency can be either you. So um, Augusta just uh, hinted, it's possible she's a, she's a one-person startup where she is. So Augusta is the storyteller for her startup. When she begins to grow up to a certain size and number, not everybody in the organization will be a spokesperson. She will identify people that will be her spokesperson. We'll say whether it's one person that is a spokesperson or multiple people, there should be consistency. But there is a place that everybody in Augusta's organization play in. That is authenticity and giving people the right experience. So your storytelling is not necessarily that thing which is said all the time. It can be the experience you give people. When people encounter you in different ways, either for you to provide the service that you provide to them, or it's even on a chat platform, virtual or in person, what is that thing, the experience of you? All those things are part of building your, your brand using the power of storytelling. So, and remember we said, and we cautiously said, do not underestimate the power of all the channels that you use in driving your visibility. Whether it's as simple as your status on WhatsApp, the pictures you put there, the way, you know, there are some people that save their names as very funny. There's a group I belong to, you know, you don't have all the numbers of everybody there. I will show you my colleague at work. The what I saw as the name of the person is RIP. And it has been there for a very long time, like RIP is and another thing. The person might perhaps, like, let's be human to say, it might be mourning someone. But if that person has a business and want to reach out to the person, if I go there and I say that, what would be my first thought? My first thought would not be of whatever service the person is providing. So such things, they all form part of your storytelling in the world that we now live in. That's something I wanted to drop for you guys. I don't know if that makes any sense. Okay, I took, um, do you want me to speak on any other thing as we, as we wrap up? How many more minutes do we have? You said eight minutes left. Um, good afternoon, sir. Yes, please. Um, okay. I want to ask, when does it disconnect between what a brand represents as their own identity and what the target audience takes from that? How do we resolve that conflict? So um, the, resolving the conflict, one of the easiest ways to do that is giving people the right experience. But again, is that experience is dimensioned. So experience is not necessarily in person. Experiences most times now are virtual. So if we look at our world now of e-commerce, practical example, it's, there's a whole lot happening in e-commerce and there's a value chain to it from the time I come to you to place an order. What is your timeline of response? Yes, we are human and I don't expect you to be awake 24 hours, but there are certain expectations of based on the time of the day or the time of the evening, what is your response time? Is there integrity into me trusting I pay you? It could be a small amount. It could be average amount. It could be a huge sum of amount. 
And again, you move from there to the dispatch. All of that happens until it gets to you. What will happen in terms of what do I think of that vendor will be a function of how seamless these processes went through. So if there's a disconnect in any way, there are multiple ways to approach it. The vendor can, in a way, if the opportunity allows, reach out to say, oh, that's not who we are and try to provide a better experience. That can be the solution. But in most cases for large corporates, it might not be so. And also understand that for large corporates, anybody can bring down a big organization now just by posting <laughs> one small thing. It can, it can happen. So nobody is immune to the, 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 the potency and the power of the digital age because you don't need, the, 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 the large corporate also do not have the exclusive power to go and tame anyone because the days of taming or gagging anyone is long gone and dead and will never happen again. So the easiest way to recreate an experience and bring back trust and that reputation is for you to consistently start doing the right thing. The right thing can be contextualized, but just summarize it to say, give people the right experience. Why is Leap Africa what it is today? Because there's a success story of, we say we are for young people, we want to train the next generation of entrepreneurs. I'm aware that in Lagos, for instance, uh, Lagos Food Bank, the founder of it is from Leap Africa. That's an experience. I'm also aware of a couple of other people across the continent that are success stories of what Leap Africa does. Why is that so? Because there is a translation of what they said they will do to reality, which is the experience. Does it mean that Leap Africa does not have challenges that they are continuously improving on? No, they will continue to improve on it, but the straight and the, the top line message is that we do this, and here is our success story. So you might also begin to show, do like a show and tell, to say, yes, you might not have had the best experience with me, but I also have these as my processes that I can tell you of testimonies. And you know, we now believe in a lot of what I see more than what I hear, because what I see is what I experience. That's what I have to say on how to bring back that trust into building our reputation using storytelling. So storytelling is not necessarily you speaking all the time. It is giving the right experience and people can now even be the ones telling your story for you.